Alucard is an immortal vampire that will take your girl with his unlimited risks. Well, if you count asking a girl if she's ever been with a guy and casually just blasting a hole through them, then yeah, I guess. Most people has known Alucard as a storytell demon. However, Alucard is actually just a menace shut-in who went to get the milk like my father who really couldn't care less if you somehow accidentally died by his own natural causes. The anime begins with one of our key MCs named Integra Helsing, our fearless Fraulein, finding herself playing hide and seek with her power-hungry uncle in the dusty old basement her late father cryptically mentioned. As she gazes at a spooky corpse, her uncle decides it's the perfect time for a surprise bang and shoots her in the arm. Uncle Dearest wants to be the big cheese of the Helsing family, but there's a tiny problem. He can't ascend the family throne without Fraulein kicking it. But here comes the plot twist. Fraulein's blood drips onto the corpse, and boom, it's alive. Zombie resurrection on the menu tonight. Meanwhile, in Cheddar Village, the local cops dial up the Helsing hotline for some supernatural assistance. Vampires and ghouls are partying like it's Halloween, and they need the experts. A vampire, getting a little too handsy with a policewoman, gets the shock of his undead life when Alucard struts in. Thinking Alucard's just your regular Joe, Mr. Vampire calls in the ghouls to rain bullets on him. But guess what? Alucard turns into a vampire smoothie and makes a speedy recovery. The vampire boss, realizing he's in hot water, tries to make a run for it with the policewoman as his hostage. Alucard? Well, he couldn't care less. He drills a hole through her, ending the vampire's career and creating his latest masterpiece, Draculina. It's like arts and crafts hour for vampires. Now, the policewoman turned vampire joins the Helsing organization, and her new job is to play hunt the vampires with Alucard. Guess she'll need some serious therapy after this gig. Integra Helsing, the big boss lady herself, is puzzled by the skyrocketing vampire stats. It's like vampires are the new trend, and everyone's joining the bloodsucking club. It's like someone's hosting a vampire making competition. Meet Father Alexander Anderson. If anyone does not love the Lord. Also know as the Paladin, a priest with a vampire hunting hobby. He gets the memo about the vampire rampage and decides it's time to clock in. And if the bloodsucking was just in England, Walter wouldn't bat an eye. But nope, it's gone international, hitting up Ireland too. Alucard and Victoria are busy clearing out a haunted building filled with ghouls. Their motto, shoot first, ghoul questions later. Ghouls are like that one ex you definitely don't want to rekindle a romance with. Once they turn you, there's no going back. Sierra's Victoria, our newest Helsing recruit, gets a taste of the action. She gets a holy bayonet makeover after the ghoul cleaning session. Anderson makes a dramatic entrance with his holy barrier, like he's auditioning for a magic show. Integra gets word that Iscariot, the Vatican's vampire busting squad, is in town, and she decides it's time for a meet and greet. It's a showdown time. Anderson and Alucard go at it like two siblings fighting for the last piece of candy. Anderson thinks he's got the upper hand, but hey, Alucard's got a head start, literally. Victoria tries to play catch with Alucard's head, but it gets pinned to the wall. Anderson's coming in hot with biblical verses, and poor Victoria's stuck in a spiritual timeout. Just when things look grim, Alucard's blood decides to get all artsy and forms a message, drink me. And bam, Victoria's the new no-life king. But she's not quite sure if that's a promotion or a curse. Enter Integra Helsing, the ultimate Helsing hype woman, armed with a quick trigger finger and zero patience for Anderson's shenanigans. She breaks up the party and tells Anderson to take his holy show elsewhere. Anderson's not too pleased and decides to get up close and personal with Integra. Victoria tries to be the peacemaker, but her attempts are about as successful as teaching a cat to do ballet. Integra reminds Anderson that chopping off Alucard's head is like giving him a haircut. It won't work. Alucard's the Helsing family's crown jewel, and they've spent a century perfecting him. Alucard starts his regeneration show, and Anderson realizes it's time for a tactical retreat. The Vatican owes Helsing big time, and Anderson's not here for a charity gala. But the plot thickens. It's not just Iscariot causing trouble. There are shadowy organizations pulling the strings behind these vampire attacks. Integra's got her eye on them, and when the time's right, she's gonna unleash Alucard to mop up the mess. After a hard day's work, Victoria and Alucard head back to the Helsing clubhouse. It's just another day in the life of a vampire-busting crew. Alucard, the undead night owl, jolts awake from a nightmare, tears streaming down his face, and he's sweating like a vampire at a garlic festival. In his dream, someone's taunting him about his no-life king gig. Hey, even vampires have their sensitive moments. Meanwhile, over at the Helsing HQ, Integra Helsing and the gang are having a brainstorming session on the recent vampire-related mayhem. 
Integra's like a detective with a magnifying glass, and she's uncovered some fishy business. Turns out, every vampire they've encountered has been wired up like a high-tech vampire Fitbit. It measures everything, their mood, their step count, and probably their Netflix preferences. There's also something weird about these ghouls. Traditionally, only those who have had a close encounter of the fang kind turn into ghouls, but now even the virgins are joining the party. It's like a vampire brunch that's open to all, regardless of their love life status. Ceres gets a new crib, a coffin, no less. She's not thrilled, but then Walter drops the bomb that it's part of her master-approved training by Alucard. Well, nothing says welcome to the family like a good old vampire nap, right? Speaking of Alucard, he struts in, calling Sirius an imbecile because, well, that's just how he says hello. Walter gifts him a fancy new pistol called the Jackal. It's got custom bullets and weighs a hefty 10 kilos, perfect for a vampire who means business. Sirius also gets an upgrade, a 30mm cannon named Harkonnen because when you're dealing with ghouls, a little extra firepower never hurts. Enter the Valentine brothers, crashing the Helsing Castle party with an army of souped-up ghouls. Integra gets the memo and realizes things are about to get messy. Ghouls are no joke, shooting them in the head won't cut it. And just when they try to evacuate via their Helsing helicopters, boom. The choppers go up in smoke. Their security team. Well, they're down for the count. Valentine Jan, the smooth talker of the brothers, makes an appearance on CCTV, calling Integra Helsing all sorts of names. Classy move, Jan. But Integra stays cool and calls in Walter for a strategy sesh. Integra's game plan. Hold the fort in the conference room until reinforcements arrive. She's not here to play, and she orders Walter to mop up the mess. Alucard, however, gets a chill down his spine. Something wicked this way comes. Ceres doesn't quite know what's going on, but it looks like it's gonna be one heck of a party. The other Valentine brother, Mr. Chop Chop, goes on a killing spree through the castle, leaving a trail of guards in pieces. But don't worry, the third floor and the conference room are still open for business. Meanwhile, the basement is hosting a one-on-one -on -one showdown between Alucard and the elder Valentine brother, Luke. Luke, the self-proclaimed Alucard fanboy, introduces himself with the enthusiasm of a rock concert groupie. He's heard all the legends and is ready to rock and roll. Silence! I'm a dog. Then you're dog food. Jan, with his ghoul army, marches toward the conference room. But then Walter, the butler with a flair for strings, cuts through the ghouls like a hot knife through butter. Jan hides behind ghouls with metal shields, thinking he's safe. But Sirius, she's got her Harkonnen cannon and turns Jan into Swiss cheese. Game over, Jan. She captures him for questioning but he's not about to sing like a canary. Walter, the string puppet master, starts the interrogation. Jan spills the beans about their mission, destroying Helsing and taking out Alucard. But before Walter can get all artistic with his strings, Integra Helsing steps in with her trusty gun, demanding answers about who's pulling the strings. Jan plays his final card, self-destruct. He goes up in flames, flipping the bird at Integra Helsing while dropping a hint about something called Millennium. Integra Helsing takes matters into her own hands, literally. She's handed a gun and steps up to put her undead comrades out of their misery. As a leader, it's her duty, even though it's like leading a zombie firing squad. Sir Iron tells Walter to dig deeper into this Millennium thing. They're going to pay back this attack with interest. Out of 96 Helsing HQ members, only 10 are left standing. They're going to need more recruits. Walter hits the library, but all he finds is that Millennium means a thousand years. Helpful, right? Integra Helsing remembers the Millennium Empire, a gang that wanted to rule the world for a thousand years. They even threw the world into a war-themed party half a century ago. Walter decides to enlist the help of a group of professional mercenaries. Integra Helsing raises an eyebrow, questioning whether they can really trust mercenaries who are only in it for the cash. Walter reassures her that these are no ordinary mercenaries, they're true professionals. As long as they have a contract and their payment, these folks, known as the Wild Geese, will stick to their word. The battle rages on between the Helsing forces and their hired mercenaries, and some of the junior soldiers are left scratching their heads. They signed up for security, not monster hunting. Their captain, a no-nonsense type, breaks it to them bluntly that they're here to deal with creatures of the night. He advises them to carry garlic, holy water, wooden stakes, and read some Bram Stoker for further instructions. Still, some don't buy it. Integra Helsing steps in, dropping a bombshell on the disbelievers. She tells them that not everything about vampires is common knowledge, in fact, it's their secret duty, dating back a century, to deal with these bloodsuckers. She then instructs them to try their skills on Sirius. The captain isn't convinced and starts mocking Sirius, suggesting he's more likely to be Frankenstein than her being a vampire. 
The team bursts into laughter, but before they can get too cozy, Integra orders Ceres to show off her skills. With a flick of her fingers, Ceres knocks the captain flat, leaving everyone in awe. Enter Alucard, who appears out of the wall like it's just another day at the office. He calls the mercenaries a bunch of cowards and lily-livered folks. Walter tries to apologize, but Alucard's just there to size up the newbies. In the midst of all this, Walter hands Integra a letter from Maxwell, the head of the Vatican's 13th Division, Iscariot Organization. They're invited to a meetup, and Integra, along with Walter, decides to attend. But Maxwell is fashionably late. Maxwell finally arrives, chatting about art in the Royal Museum before noticing Integra. He apologizes for the tardiness, but Integra isn't here for small talk. She wants to know why the Vatican and Iscariot are in enemy territory. Maxwell informs her they're not here for a brawl today, but Integra isn't buying it, especially after Iscariot sent Anderson to Badrick, leading to the deaths of Helsing's men. Maxwell gets fiery, saying they couldn't care less about Protestant soldiers, and things get heated as he calls Integra a Protestant so. Alucard, ever the showman, decides to make an entrance, mocking Maxwell for his dramatic entrance. He even throws in a few insults for good measure. Maxwell returns the pleasantries with a disrespectful greeting. But before the showdown can commence, Ceres and some civilians interrupt. Alucard and Anderson reluctantly put their weapons down, and the moment passes. Alucard heads back into the wall to nap, and Anderson returns to Rome, leaving Maxwell fuming. Integra and Maxwell calm their subordinates, deciding to have a chat at a cafe instead. Maxwell spills the beans about Millennium, and things are getting interesting. Later, Alucard and Walter discuss what Maxwell revealed about Millennium Nazis. Alucard suspects Nazi involvement, as there are only three groups who can use undead in combat. Helsings, Nazis, and himself. Nazis undead research facilities were wiped out 50 years ago, and now they're out for revenge. Integra orders Alucard to search and destroy every last one of them. The wild geese captain is baffled by Alucard sipping wine in broad daylight. It's not exactly what the legends say. Cirrus, on the other hand, isn't enjoying her coffin ride. Alucard reserved a room under the name J.H. Blenner and Cirrus's coffin gets stopped, but Alucard hypnotizes the guard to allow it. Someone is watching Alucard's every move, and Helsing and the Vatican are now on the same page, trying to clean up a mess from 50 years ago. Alucard wakes Cirrus up one night, and she's having a nightmare about her cannon's spirit. She peeks out the window to find the hotel surrounded by the military and news reporters, claiming two terrorists are on the loose. Anderson, Integra Helsing, and others watch the news. The SWAT team and snipers take their positions around the hotel. Mr. Tubalcane, the mastermind behind the military chaos, orders the soldiers to shoot the terrorists on sight. The military storms the hotel, raining bullets on Alucard. As the SWAT team withdraws, Alucard regenerates and takes them out. Cirrus hides in a cabinet and emerges to a room filled with corpses. Alucard orders her to prepare for battle, and she protests, not wanting to kill humans. But Alucard is adamant, these soldiers are here to kill or die. Alucard calls into Grahelsing, informing her they've wiped out the SWAT team sent to take him down. Alucard, a trained monster, is ready to wreak havoc in his true form. Cirrus distracts Tubalcane with her sniper rifle and cannon. Alucard overpowers Tubalcane, breaking his leg, slashing his arm, and drinking his blood, gaining valuable information about Millennium. The Wild Geese captain arrives to pick up Alucard and Cirrus. Tubalcane's body is discovered on TV, and Alucard is far stronger than they ever imagined. It's clear they have some undead research to do. It's time to return to their old haunt, Jeburo, Pantershens. All those who stand in Alucard's way will meet their end. The Major of Millennium watches in anticipation, it's just the beginning of the battle. The Major of the last battalion has arrived at their home base, wearing a sinister smirk. The veteran Nazis watch him approach with suspicion. He doesn't look like the typical Nazi SS officer. Meanwhile, Maxwell is interrogating an old priest who collaborated with Millennium back in 1941. The priest defends himself, claiming they were forced to collaborate under direct orders from the Fura. Integra Helsing orders Alucard to return to their base for a round table discussion with the Queen, but they lack a quick mode of transportation. Back at the base, one of the old veteran colonels confronts the Major, expressing his anger for not being turned into a vampire. A soldier from the Major's side fires a warning shot as tensions rise. The colonel questions the Major's intentions with his army of a thousand vampires. The Major responds with an air of sadistic glee, relishing the infinite pleasure of war. He explains the operation to create vampires, the secret last battalion. The old priest, who had funded their operation, admits his collaboration. He had even wanted to become a vampire himself. Maxwell bids him farewell, and one of his men shoots the old priest. Alucard and the captain of the wild geese find themselves at Alucard's birthplace. Anderson bursts in, and a tense standoff ensues. Anderson hands them release papers for a jet from the Vatican. 
ordering them to leave. Helsing, along with Maxwell and others, attend a meeting with the Queen of England. Alucard joins them. Integra Helsing requests Alucard to remove his sunglasses in the Queen's presence. Alucard approaches the Queen, who hasn't aged a day since they last met 50 years ago. Alucard bows to the Queen, and she touches his face. Alucard begins his report, explaining the resurgence of a crazed Nazi major attempting to create a vampire army. Walter and Alucard had previously thwarted their operation, but they refused to give up. These remnants of the Third Reich are now known as the Last Battalion. A mysterious messenger, a cat-eared girl, suddenly appears, presenting a message from the Major. She defies the airtight security and her communication device is placed on the table. The Major has massacred the old veterans who opposed him. The Major and Alucard exchange greetings, and Integra Helsing demands to know the Major's intentions. The Major's response is simple, he has no purpose. Maxwell calls him insane, and someone from the Vatican's Iscariot mocks the Major. The Major, in turn, mocks their god and questions his sanity. The Major has returned to the Third Reich's SS base. The Major challenges them to stop him, explaining that they are not his enemies, Alucard is. Alucard accepts the challenge, and Integra Helsing orders Alucard to shoot the messenger in her device. <laughs> The messenger, despite being shot in the head, disappears. The Queen orders Integra Helsing and Alucard to destroy them. Warrant Officer Schrodinger, the messenger girl, returns to the SS base. Their enormous ship, Deus Ex Machina, takes off and their air fleet is ready. The Major orders them to announce their return to the mortal world. The first lieutenant of the Major's officer hijacks one of England's battleships and marks it with their cursed banner. Walter asks Alucard why he turned Ceres into a vampire. Alucard replies that it was her own decision. Integra Helsing cuts her finger, orders Ceres to lick the blood, and tells her to prepare for battle. Maxwell orders Anderson to return to their base, as this time their enemy is the god of war, Mars. The Royal Navy informs Integra Helsing about the hijacking of their Eagle carrier. Two SAS helicopters sent to the carrier are shot down with a single musket rifle shot. Integra Helsing asks Walter for a solution, and he suggests sending Alucard and Ceres on the Eagle carrier. Vampires consider the sea as the lowest pit of hell. Three fighter jets attempt to attack the floating fortress but get shot down by musket shots from the first lieutenant while singing Carl Maria von Weber's Der Freischutz. Despite being shot at, the first lieutenant senses Alucard approaching. Alucard has possessed an SR-71 reconnaissance craft. He dives at full speed, and despite being shot by the first lieutenant, he crashes the aircraft into the carrier, destroying it. Rising from the flames, Alucard looks down at the first lieutenant. Soldiers try to shoot Alucard with grenades, but he regenerates and bites off their heads. The first lieutenant shoots Alucard with her musket, and although the bullets pierce him multiple times, he catches one with his teeth and crushes it. He starts walking toward her, punches her, lifts her by her neck, pierces her heart with her own musket, drinks her blood, and absorbs her. Let him the warrant officer appears on the deck with a communication device, and the Major communicates with them. Through her sacrifice, they plan to overthrow Alucard. The Major stops Dr. Doc from cremating the van. The Major is watching Alucard, who is laughing manically. He revels in the pleasure of war, longing for an all-out conflict to save her after over half a century in the darkness. The Major addresses his men, where one equals a million. Anderson watches the Red Moon, and their camp group of a thousand vampires is ready to turn the world to ashes. They are nearing Europe, returning to their old battlefield. The situation in London is dire. The Helsing HQ has lost contact with the central government, the London BTN, Oak Air Force Base, National Defense HQ, and Intelligence Control Headquarters. Reports from civilian planes indicate the sighting of an airship fleet heading towards London. The war has already begun, and Integra Helsing informs a sweating general of the gravity of the situation. The Anderson and other civilians witness the massive flying ship in the sky. The Major addresses his troops, emphasizing that this is the night when their wish for war will come true. Doc explains the plan to the soldiers. The Major singles out the first lieutenant, Zoran Blitz, instructing him to lead troops to Zeppelin II and head towards Helsing HQ, but to avoid starting the fight until the main forces arrive. The Major warns Zoran about Integra Helsing, the head of the most powerful vampire hunting clan, and Cyrus Victoria, a policewoman with untapped potential. The first lieutenant betrays the general, taking control of the base with other vampires and taking Integra Helsing hostage. Integra Helsing remains defiant, ordering Walter to eliminate all of them, which shocks even the general. As the attack on the city unfolds, Integra Helsing orders evacuation, but decides to stay behind as the commanding officer. She hands the general silver bullets blessed with holy water to use against the vampires. The general and his officers choose to fight rather than escape. 
Integra Helsing leaves the base and orders Walter to make his way through the city. German enemy soldiers are brutally attacking the civilian population, even resorting to cannibalism and creating ghouls from newborn babies. Integra Helsing shoots one of the German vampires and informs the Major of her approach. General Penwood sends a public message, indicating that the base is under attack. He recalls the first time he saw a young Integra Helsing, who asked him to help her if she ever needed it. He remembers those words as he faces the invading enemies. The enemies retreat and the enemy commander mocks General Penwood, but he laughs defiantly and detonates the bombs around the chamber, destroying the entire base. Integra Helsing is driving towards Helsing HQ but suddenly stops when Walter senses something amiss. Walter steps out of the vehicle and instructs Integra to take the car and escape through a different route, not looking back no matter what happens. He knows he can't hold back the advancing monsters for much longer. Integra Helsing takes the wheel and commands Walter to return alive. Walter confronts the captain of the Major's army and they engage in combat. The Major communicates with Walter from the ship above. He orders other soldiers to follow Integra Helsing, who is on the run alone. The vampires rush to capture her. They eventually find her and the chase begins. Integra Helsing's car crashes, but she defends herself by decapitating one of the attackers with a katana. She challenges the vampires to attack and capture her if they can. One of the vampires lunges at her but is destroyed by Anderson's bayonets. Anderson, known as the Angel Dust, defends Helsing with his Iscariot army, addressing them on their mission and vision while battling the vampires. The battle is intense, with chopping, shooting, and slashing of vampires. Integra Helsing watches the brutal conflict unfold. Maxwell reflects on his past, remembering the first time he met Anderson and how he was determined to become great, harboring a desire to look down on all those who had left him behind. His parents had abandoned him, but he had found purpose within the Iscariot organization. Priests wake Maxwell from his deep sleep, informing him of Anderson's armed priest squad's engagement with the remnants of the Letts Battalion and the current situation. They express concern about Anderson's impetuous actions. Maxwell had explicitly ordered Anderson to avoid hostilities and simply observe. Maxwell observes the chaos and destruction in London, the once great imperial capital now engulfed in flames. He learns that there has not been such a fire since the Great London Air Raid and that estimating the current death toll is difficult. Chaos reigns in the United States as well, with the White House in flames and the President and several members of the Cabinet killed. The enemies are positioning themselves around the presidential residence, but Maxwell orders his forces to intervene only if the situation escalates further. He sees this chaos as beneficial for Iscariot's goals. When one of his subordinates questions why Millennium has not advanced further, Maxwell dismisses it, stating that he is only interested in England, Helsing, and Alucard. Maxwell's subordinates inform him that various knightly orders have assembled, and Maxwell, now promoted to Archbishop, commands a united army known as the Ninth Crusade. They are focused on reconquering Britain. Maxwell is shown satellite images of a ship approaching London but dismisses it, as his attention remains on England. He believes that Helsing, Millennium, and Alucard will all be eliminated, and Iscariot will emerge victorious. Meanwhile, Alucard approaches London, perceiving the horrors and atrocities committed in the city. Anderson's squad has been reduced in number due to their encounters with vampires. Integra Helsing, along with Anderson and his squad, is making her way to Helsing HQ. They encounter a tense standoff when Heinkel points a gun at Integra, but Anderson decides to escort her safely to the HQ, considering it dangerous for a woman to be alone at night. Zorin Blitz part of Millennium, attacks Helsing HQ with V-1 missiles, but Sira's Victoria, armed with Harkon and two, shoots down all the missiles. She witnesses the devastation in London and feels sorrow for the civilians caught in the chaos. The Knights of the Ninth Crusade, led by Archbishop Maxwell, prepare to make their move to reclaim Britain. They are determined to liberate the country from what they see as heresy, and monsters. Back at Helsing HQ, Ceres continues her battle against the vampires. She is momentarily affected by an illusion created by Zorin but manages to break free and confront the vampires. The wild geese, led by Bernadotte, join the fight as well, but they are too late to prevent some vampires from infiltrating the HQ. The geese plan to play defensively, but Ceres decides to take an offensive approach. In a somewhat awkward moment, Bernadotte tries to kiss Ceres, but she rejects his advances, much to the dismay of the other geese members. As they prepare for the battle ahead, the geese are massacred by the invading vampires, setting the stage for a fierce confrontation between Ceres and the enemy forces. Meanwhile, Maxwell's ship hovers over the burning city of London as the chaos continues to unfold. Child Bernadotte once approached his grandfather, feeling downtrodden by the taunts of his peers at school who labeled him as the son of a murderer. The old man, his voice weathered by years of experience, consoled him with tales of their long line of mercenaries, including Bernadotte's own father, 
who had met his end in pursuit of their trade. He explained that mercenaries willingly ventured to battlefields worldwide, not by anyone's coercion but by their own choice, chasing meager wages while risking their lives, either to kill or be killed. With a heavy heart, the grandfather expressed his regret for the young Bernadotte's troubles, but also urged him not to worry, for one day, it would all make sense. And indeed, that day arrived within the confines of Helsing HQ. The geese, who had been tasked with stopping vampires, found themselves ill-equipped for the job. Normal bullets were useless against the undead, and the formidable Zorin invaded their sanctuary. A soldier informed Bernadotte that their escape route had been sealed, most of their comrades were injured, and they struggled to secure their barricades. Amidst the chaos, one soldier bid his captain farewell. Another soldier, mentally shattered, yearned to flee but realized there was no escape. Their graves awaited them, marked by the colossal manor that served as a headstone, with Integra Helsing as their Cerberus. The epitaph, the captain thought, should have celebrated their bravery, but one coward's actions threatened to turn it into a mockery. The captain was determined to ensure they met their fate as true soldiers, even if it meant forcing them to fight or die. Sector B soldiers fell, and Zorin taunted Helsing's supposed power. One soldier tried to shoot her, but vampires shielded her from harm. He was ensnared in an illusion of his deceased daughter while Zorin mercilessly cut him in two. As the vampires feasted on fallen soldiers, Siras unleashed a surprise attack with a semi-automatic cannon. The barricades were frail, ammunition dwindling, and it felt like an old situation from a Uganda jungle raid. Vampires launched rocket attacks against the barricades, but Siras annihilated them from behind. Out of ammo, she found herself in a dire situation. Zorin, last one standing, used her illusions on Siras, conjuring memories of a painful childhood. However, Siras resisted the illusions, recalling her parents' brutal murders by burglars. Zorin severed her arm and gouged her eyes, preparing for the final blow. Just as Zorin was about to deliver the fatal strike, Bernadotte intervened, showering her with silver bullets. Despite being shot again by a vampire, Bernadotte pressed forward. Zorin hurled her scythe, impaling him. As he lay dying, Bernadotte kissed Siras, content that he'd perished while protecting her. Siras, grief-stricken, clutched his lifeless body and let out a heart-wrenching scream. Reinforcements arrived for the vampires, but Zorin's illusions no longer held sway over Siras. Driven to a furious rage, she bit Bernadotte, drinking his blood and regenerating her wounds, shattering the illusion. The vampires, once feared SS officers, cowered before her, petrified by a badly wounded girl. Siras launched a merciless assault, tearing vampires apart and massacring them. She crushed Zorin, pinning her against the wall, and as she caught a glimpse of her allies and the Major, her face met a brutal end at the hands of Siras. Siras made a solemn promise to the captain to annihilate every last one of them. With a final salute from the remaining geese, she flew off into the breaking dawn. Heading towards the city of death without fear of the sun's rays, her determination unyielding. Meanwhile, the Major surveyed the burning city of London, informed of Zorin's demise by the warrant officer. Their downfall had begun, and he vowed to either conquer or be conquered, standing resolute through treacherous days and despair-filled nights. As the scene unfolds, we find ourselves gazing at the sky, where a helicopter from the Ninth Crusade is busy creating angelic figures. Maxwell, drunk with power, takes the mic and addresses the general public, declaring himself the moral adjutant of the Angel of Death. I mean, come on, who gave him that title, the self-proclaimed Angel's assistant manager? Maxwell boldly proclaims that he's here to enforce judgment on behalf of the Inquisition, and the accused parties are none other than Britain and a bunch of monsters. Apparently, their punishment is a one-way ticket to meet the Grim Reaper. Talk about a rough day at the office. Now, our hero, the Major, is standing atop his Zeppelin with his trusty warrant officer, Doc. Doc, ever the sensible one, urges the Major to get inside the Zeppelin because, well, things are getting messy out there. The Major's response, is our new science project ready? Doc hesitates, admitting it's still a bit unstable, but hey, who can resist the Major's whims? As the Major starts singing the song of war, the vampires and crusade forces assemble for an epic showdown. Maxwell, in all his wisdom, decides it's a great time to order an attack on a vampire attacking their Zeppelin. Doc pleads with the Major to get inside, but the Major's too busy being a rock star. I mean, can you blame him? It's not every day you get to sing for a vampire versus helicopter concert. Just as an enemy helicopter locks onto the Major, Strings, our surprise hero, swoops in and disassembles it like it's a Lego set. Apparently, Walter has joined forces with the enemy as a vampire. That's one way to switch sides, I suppose. Maxwell's crusade starts shooting everyone, even the general public. Integra Helsing and Anderson are absolutely furious, calling Maxwell drunk with power and domination. Meanwhile, other Iscariot members are ordered to detain Integra Helsing. They point their guns at her, but Anderson, being the voice of reason, steps in. Guys, we can't take her down, not even if we team up. 
Anderson and Cirrus soon sense the presence of Alucard, who's returned with his ghost ships. He charges into the battlefield, standing tall between the Ninth Crusade, Anderson, and the Nazi captain. They're like an awkward family reunion at a museum, standing next to a painting of spears. And then, it's time for Integra Helsing's orders. She tells Alucard to paint the town red, or in this case, white and black, with his silver and iron guns. It's like she's redecorating the place with bullets. Alucard starts singing, and out of his coffin come. Everything he's ever absorbed, including armies, vampires, and who knows what else. Maxwell can't believe his eyes, he might need a new prescription for those glasses. Alucard's true form, Dracula, emerges in ancient armor, releasing his army of the dead. The crusade retreats, the vampires are obliterated, and Maxwell is left trembling. This isn't a battle, it's a full-blown massacre. Maxwell's helicopter crashes, but he's safe behind bulletproof glass. Well, at least he was until Anderson's bayonets bid it farewell, shattering the glass. Maxwell's day just went from bad to worse. As Anderson walks toward Maxwell's lifeless body, he closes Maxwell's eyes and orders the priests to return and protect the Vatican. Anderson fears this was the Major's crazy plan all along, sacrifice everything just to take down one man, Alucard who knew Alucard was worth that much trouble. Thousands of men just to kill one vampire. Seems like a bit of an overkill, doesn't it? But hey, that's how things roll in the world of anime. As Anderson confronts Alucard, they exchange blows and witty remarks, trying to one-up each other in this epic showdown. Alucard is impressed by Anderson's ripped physique, it seems he's been hitting the gym hard. The fight continues, with Alucard showing off his supernatural skills and Anderson refusing to back down. Alucard's taunts about needing billions more lives to kill him aren't exactly helping Anderson's self-esteem. As the Major's army crumbles, it's down to just Alucard and Anderson. The final showdown is upon us, folks. But wait, it's not over yet. Agents from Iscariot join the fray, charging forward to launch an assault on Hell itself. The Catholics are fighting for their dogma, the Nazis are fighting for victory, and then there's Alucard, fighting to revitalize his dream. Anderson reveals his trump card, covered in mystery and shrouded in secrecy. It's none other than Helena's nail, the long-lost holy artifact from Rome. Alucard tries to stop him, but Anderson is determined to turn himself into a thorny mess, enraging Alucard even more. It's a battle of wills, faith, and, well, really spiky things. As they clash, Anderson symbolizes the holy with his bayonets, and Alucard symbolizes the reverse cross with his guns. They shoot, stab, and generally make a mess of each other. Alucard even tries shooting the nail in Anderson's heart but it turns out holy nails are bulletproof. Who knew? In a final, dramatic moment, Anderson uses the nail, turning himself into thorns and infuriating Alucard. They go head to head, guns blazing, swords slashing, and it looks like the battle is reaching its epic climax. But in the world of anime, nothing is ever that simple. As we zoom in on the fiery chaos that is the Elfer Rosenberg burning and the seventh bridge lost, the Major is chilling like a villain, savoring his meal and showing about as much remorse as a rock. He casually orders the captain to hand out ammo and grenades like their party favors. Doc tries to help by giving the Major a gun, but it turns out the Major is about as accurate with a firearm as a blindfolded circus clown. Just when you think things couldn't get crazier, the captain decides to rebel against the Major, and before you can say Vampire Uprising, he's Vampire Chow. Maybe he should have stuck to just complaining in the break room. The Major, not one to miss a beat, starts singing his little heart out. It's like karaoke night in the middle of a battlefield. Someone should tell him that it's not the best time for a musical number. In the midst of all this chaos, Alucard takes a brief moment to reminisce about his rough childhood. He's been through it all, fighting Ottomans, getting beheaded multiple times, and being dragged around as a prisoner. It's safe to say he's had a worse upbringing than most of us. But wait, Cirrus wakes him up from this nightmare with a shout loud enough to wake the dead. Alucard can't help but mock her for being too noisy, but let's be honest, he's not exactly known for his subtlety either. He regenerates and is back in action. It's worth noting that they could have tried to kill Alucard 523 years ago, but now, they're in way over their heads. Talk about missed opportunities. Integra Helsing recalls her father's words about Alucard, seeing immortal monsters as nothing more than crying children. Well, Alucard must have thrown some epic tantrums over the centuries. He decides to pierce Anderson's chest and rip out his heart with Helena's nail. And then, something surprising happens, Alucard starts crying bloody tears. Who knew vampires had tear ducts? Anderson and Alucard exchange heartfelt words as Anderson turns to dust. 
Just when you thought the battle was over, Walter makes a dramatic entrance by slicing through the building. Talk about arriving fashionably late to the party. Yumi from Iscariot tries to take on Walter, but she ends up in pieces thanks to Walter's strings. Heinkel takes a bullet to the face from the Nazi captain. It's like a gruesome game of who can survive the longest. Sir Iron and General have a nice chat about the current situation and a potential traitor in Helsing's HQ. They suspect Walter, who conveniently warned Helsing's butler about an attack years ago but was absent during the actual attack. Looks like someone's been playing both sides for a while. Walter and Alucard face off, and Alucard admits he used to like Walter better in the good old days. Alucard asks for orders from Integra Helsing, but it's clear that everyone, including Walter, is waiting for her command. The tension is thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Integra Helsing, in a fit of rage, orders them to search and destroy without hesitation. Walter gets a nod of approval from her. He must be thrilled. The Zeppelin lands, and the Major invites Integra Helsing into his office. Integra enters with Siras, and in a shocking twist, she shoots the warrant officer at the gate. Surprise! The battle begins. Alucard charges at Walter, who uses his strings to cut, drag, and smash Alucard into a building. Alucard tries to shoot Walter, but it's like trying to tickle a brick wall. Alucard summons the Hound of Baskervilles, but Walter slices it in two, probably ruining his chance at becoming a dog trainer. In a surprising turn of events, Alucard's gun explodes in his hands, and Luke Valentine pops out of the Hound's belly. Walter uses Luke as a puppet with the Hound, attacking Alucard. It's like a chaotic puppet show from hell. Walter takes a knee and starts coughing up blood, clearly not at his best. He decides to stand up and move toward Alucard, still using Luke as a weapon. Alucard shoots Luke, ending the Hound's reign of terror. Alucard takes things up a notch by cutting off Walter's limbs and legs, trapping him, and going for the heart. But surprise, it's not Walter's heart he's stabbing, it's Luke again. Alucard then transforms into a young boy and starts mocking Walter for being weak. It's like a twisted game of rock, paper, scissors. Alucard turns Walter into a little brat, reminding him that his body means nothing. Apparently, this rivalry has been going on for 60 years, and not much has changed. It's like the world's longest-running grudge match. As the climax unfolds, Ceres is the designated escort for Integra Helsing inside the Zeppelin. But here's the twist, the vampires that Ceres killed earlier are actually happy to be gone. I mean, who knew one death could be such a drag? The Major, ever the showman, takes the mic and addresses the vampires. It's like a twisted episode of Vampires Got Talent. The captain of the Major's army finally steps out of the shadows. Drama level, off the charts. But just as things heat up, the Zeppelin decides to join the party and starts exploding. Talk about bad timing. The captain, being a helpful soul, shows Integra Helsing the way to the main chamber, all while dodging the fiery explosions like a pro. Integra, in a moment of admiration, thanks him and marches toward the main chamber. Meanwhile, Ceres, not one to be left out, picks up two machine guns from the floor and starts shooting. Well, she was always one to make a dramatic entrance. But the captain isn't about to let Ceres steal the spotlight. He shoots her right back. Ceres, undeterred, attempts her blood art, but the captain's werewolf aura says, Not today, young vampire. It's like watching a supernatural game of rock-paper-scissors. Meanwhile, Alucard takes a break from mocking Walter to drop some existential knowledge. He starts talking about how Major never thought of him as a vampire or even a human. Nope, to Major, Alucard was basically a mobile castle, a walking river of death, and a horde of reanimated corpses under the control of a tyrant's will. I mean, who wouldn't want that for their sidekick? Major waged this war just to take down Alucard, an impossible-to-kill foe. And in a shocking twist, Major remembers the time during World War II when Alucard offered him the chance to become a vampire. But the Major, ever the independent soul, declined. After all, his life belongs to him, and he's not one to share. The union of minds infusing with another makes one a vampire, and that's why Major despises Alucard. But Alucard, in his usual theatrical style, reminds Major that tyrants often meet their end due to their arrogance. It's like he's giving him a life lesson right before a battle to the death. As the werewolf proves too strong for Ceres, he kicks her, sending her plummeting down the Zeppelin's basement. It's not looking good for our heroic vampire. But just when she's about to give up, the spirit of Bernadotte appears and encourages her to keep fighting. It's like having a pep talk from beyond the grave. Ceres, fueled by newfound determination, dodges the werewolf's attacks and even bites his legs. Bernadotte makes a surprise appearance, punching a silver tooth right into the werewolf's heart. Talk about teamwork from the afterlife. Back in the main chamber, Ceres takes on the captain, who proves to be too strong for her. He kicks her, tossing her aside like a ragdoll. 
But Cirrus isn't giving up just yet. She grabs a massive bomb from the floor and hurls it toward the werewolf. The werewolf, showing some mad soccer skills, kicks the bomb away, but Cirrus and the werewolf keep exchanging blows. Cirrus gets creative and bites the werewolf's legs again, allowing Bernadotte to punch that silver tooth even deeper into the werewolf's heart. The werewolf meets his end with a smile and turns to Ash, releasing his soul. Cirrus, despite the odds, emerges victorious from this intense battle. Cirrus enters the main chamber where the Major is, and she starts shooting at him. But the Major, being the cunning strategist he is, is protected by a bulletproof glass. It's like shooting fish in a, well, bulletproof glass. Major takes a moment to chat with Integra Helsing, informing her that Alucard Nosferatu is about to vanish from existence. And just when things can't get any weirder, the warrant officer cuts off her own head and jumps into the river of blood that Alucard is in the process of sucking. It's like a scene from a horror comedy. Walter, who's been enjoying the chaos, decides to step in and cut Alucard in half. But it's clear that Walter can't defeat Alucard now, and his chance has slipped through his fingers. The sacrifice is made, an army of vampires, thousands of crusaders, Anderson, Iscariot, a werewolf, and even half of Walter's life all come down to this moment to kill Alucard. As Alucard sucks in the warrant officer, he begins to see a sunset he witnessed centuries ago. It's like having a flashback right before oblivion. Alucard starts to fade, releasing the blood he's absorbed over the years. He closes his eyes and assimilates Schrodinger's nature. It turns out the warrant officer was a Cheshire cat, jumping between worlds of probability. But now, he can't identify himself anymore. Alucard, too, becomes a nowhere entity, just an imaginary number. He leaves behind his cursed mark on a rock and bids farewell to Integra Helsing. Major, who's given everything he had in this battle, reflects on his first win in many wars. It's almost like he lived for this day. Cirrus appears behind Integra, and it's clear that these two girls will be the ones to take down the Major. Walter can't contain his laughter at the death of Alucard, but he's also got a sinister grin. Suddenly, he's shot by Heinkel, who unloads a barrage of bullets into him. Walter doesn't mind being shot, but he makes a quick escape, reminding Heinkel that he has the right to shoot but not to kill him. He's got a point. Walter cuts off his own leg and escapes to the Zeppelin. Integra Helsing, Cirrus, and Walter's old lab are all engulfed in flames. Walter's inventions, it turns out, were a bit of a letdown. But he did manage to study Mina Harker's skeleton, the beginning of it all. The legend goes that the Helsings defeated Dracula, and he became human. But Alucard isn't truly dead, he's still inside Integra. The blood of a vampire can't be erased by any divine sacrament, holy water, or crucifix. So, Doc tried to imitate Alucard by experimenting on Mina Harker's corpse. In the end, all he managed to make were defective copies. Walter, unable to escape the fiery blaze, meets his end. Integra Helsing senses his death and mourns it, her expression a mix of sorrow and relief. She manages to escape the exploding Zeppelin, leaving behind the chaos. Fast forward 30 years, and Integra Helsing has aged gracefully. Iscariot pays her a visit, but the rookie agents are itching for a fight. Heinkel, however, shows them the spirit of Bernadotte guarding the castle. It's like having your very own guardian angel, even in death. Penwood Jr., curious about his grandfather's fate, asks Integra Helsing for answers. She shares some tall tales and, of course, asks him to foot the bill for a new helicopter. The Penwood family truly can't catch a break. Integra Helsing and Cirrus engage in a playful spat over Integra's aging wrinkles. They both know that when Integra dies, the Helsings will go with her. Cirrus takes a humorous jab by imitating Alucard but Integra Helsing is having none of it. She kicks Cirrus in the face, making it clear that joking about Alucard is off limits. And just when it seems like a peaceful night, Alucard's coffin and the rock with the seal begin to bleed. Alucard has returned, and he's hungry. He was so busy killing that he hasn't eaten in 30 years. Integra Helsing wakes up just in time to kick Alucard away, proving that even in old age, she's still got some fight left in her. Cirrus, the ever-patient observer, opens the door and switches on the light. Alucard has been busy killing millions, but now he's returned, and he's ready for a bite. And so, the epic tale comes full circle with Alucard's resurrection, a fitting end to a wild adventure. That concludes the anime. Hope you enjoyed the video and let me know your thoughts down below. I'm out.